Igår träffade jag Stig Dagemans dotter. Hon var bara tre år gammal när hennes pappa begick ett självmord. Lyssna här. Stig Dageman, det är en av Sveriges mest betydelsefulla författare. Hans böcker och övriga texter har präglat mycket av vår samtida svenska litteratur. Stig Dagemans mamma övergav honom redan som spädbarn och det präglade hans liv och mycket av det han själv skrev. Han led också av svåra depressioner. En av Stig Dagemans mest citerade texter det är novellen Vårt behov av tröst. Och den skrev han en kort tid innan han tog sitt eget liv. Då var han bara 31 år gammal och året var 1954. Jag saknar tro och kan därför aldrig bli en lycklig människa. En lycklig människa ska aldrig behöva frukta att hennes liv är ett meningslöst irrande mot en vissa död. Jag varken ärvt en gud eller en fast punkt på jorden varifrån jag skulle kunna tilldra mig en guds uppmärksamhet. Jag har heller inte ärvt skeptikens väl dolda raseri, rationalistens ökensinne eller ateistens brinnande oskuld. Jag vågar därför inte kasta sten på henne som tror på ting på vilka jag tvivlar. Eller på honom som dyrkar ett tvivel. Som vore inte det även omgivet av mörker. Den stenen skulle träffa mig själv. I om en sak är jag fast övertygad. Att människans behov av tröst är omättligt. Ja, Stig Dagemans rader var alltså detta ur eh, vårt behov av tröst. Och nu har jag bjudit hit eh, Stig Dagemans dotter, Lo Dageman, välkommen hit. Hej, tack. And Nancy Pix, who is a writer and a journalist. And the two of you have done this book. And Skuggorna vi bär är den svenska titeln. Och det är en väldigt speciell bok om två öden, två människor som vi ska prata om nu. Jag kanske ska börja med att prata lite, lite svenska i alla fall. För att du är ju trots allt svensk. Det är jag. Det är ja. du. Även om Nancy nu inte kommer att förstå någonting. Men om bara kort så var du väldigt liten när din pappa tog Jag skulle just fylla tre. Så att ja. jag har ju inga minnen Nej. av honom. Nej. Och det är de minnena som du under många år har försökt att pussla ihop för att få en, bild, en egen bild av din pappa, va? Ja, det, det är ju det att jag, som sagt, ordet pappa använde jag ju aldrig, Nej. för jag hade ingen. Utan det är, eh, men det är ett otroligt arv som han lämnade ja. efter sig. Och det är det arvet som betyder mycket för mig och som jag vill föra vidare till mina söner. Och Dan hade ju gjort filmen här som mm. vi såg. Din son. Ja. Och, och det är ju spännande för från början så var det alla andra visste mycket mer om Stig Dagemann mm. än vad du visste om din pappa. Och som du vet, man behöver hitta sin egen ingång. Mm. Så jag stack iväg till Amerika ja. och så småningom mm. började böka runt i allt det här. Så so you went to the US and what right. happened? You got married? Um, I got married, you know, I got a career and I got kids. And when you get children that are American and they don't read Swedish, uh, you know, this was the time when I thought, oh my God, you know, I need to know more. About your father? Yes, or, yes. And you explain that you don't call him your father because you never got to know him really. Well, I mean, if people ask, I do have a father, mm. but you know, it's not a daddy. Mm. It's not. Papa. But it's also a person that is surrounded by a myth. Mm. Also, probably also, he was enormously talented, but he was all, he committed suicide, and that mm. creates a lot of. Mm -hmm. He 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 leave a lot of questions behind. Exactly. Mm. Uh, and many, many 
children in my situation would, you know, be be asking similar questions. Mm -hmm. And I did pursue sort of a career that involved a lot of psychology mm -hmm. and so forth because I found that a very helpful, um, yeah, helpful in my search. So what did you find? Because you started to translate and you started to use... Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm network to create uh, your own mm -hmm. picture sort mm -hmm. of in English? Well, I, I'm not done. <laughs> um, I have been working with um, just certain texts and done very close readings of certain texts as we have been working with them. So for example, Vårt behov av tröst är omätligt for the film. Um, then a lot of Stig's short stories that are very, very, but they are sort of semi-autobiographical. They give a lot of clues if you know uh, the places he's writing about and the people he, you know, he's writing about. So we, we came out with um, a brand new collection of short stories in the US mm -hmm. called Sleet, translated by a brilliant translator, Stephen Hartman, who, who lives here. Um, and that, that was incredibly rich. And then, mm -hmm. out of the blue, <laughs> truly out of the blue, came Nancy and, and said, well, um, this play. And, you know, one thing led to another. And we then, Skogana Mart, Marty's Shadow. We needed you have to, to explain about the play. What, what is it about? Because he's, yeah. I just explained the loss of his mother. He was abandoned mm -hmm. early. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and this kind of yeah. went on and on in his soul yeah. and head all the time. Uh, so Stieg had written some about complicated mothers earlier, touched on it in his writing. But this play is really a new departure in his writing, looking at mother-son relationship that he then continues in A Burnt Child, Brent Vaughan. The play is about a mother with two sons. It's set in a country that has gone through a war, so it's not Sweden. Um, Stig doesn't say, but we sort of know it's Paris and France after the war. And this mother has one son who died a hero in the French resistance. And she has one son who is a weakling, unmanly, uh, very, very sh nearsighted. And she doesn't treat him well. She doesn't love him as much? He is very hard to love. Mm. So uh, there is another important person, person in, in this book, mm -hmm. and that is... Uh, your relative, yes. Etta, Etta Fadon. Tell us about her, because they're kind of... The connection between the two of them is the book. Exactly. So Etta Fadon was a Viennese Jewish intellectual. She had a very bourgeois upbringing, was beautifully educated. And then um, she rebelled from her bourgeois family, moved to Berlin, became a journalist, a writer, biographer, translator, had quite a brilliant career, but then also had written a biography of Walter Rathenau, who was a Jewish foreign minister for Germany, a liberal. And that got her in trouble early on, so that by 1932, she had to flee Germany mm -hmm. already. She was already getting death threats. She chose to go to Barcelona, there she was a radical involved in um, the um, anarchist movement there. Uh, of course, things didn't end well for the radicals there either, and so she and her two sons fled to France, where she barely survived the war in hiding. And um, by the time Stieg meets her in 1947, you have to imagine her white-haired with those thick eyeglasses, down to her last copy of Goethe, she has no teeth and she's huddled in her shawl, mm. making a living as a palm reader. Mm -hmm. mm. From being that famous writer that, to yes. a palm mm. reader. To a palm mm. reader yeah. by the And end. what about her sons? Because she had two sons. She had two sons, so the elder son, Jean, 
a beautiful young yes, man. Yes, he was handsome and brave, and and he was her soulmate. And um, he died valiantly. Um, he was killed by French collaborators mm. in the French resistance just before the town where he lived mm. was liberated and absolutely broke her heart. And then she had her younger son, Michel, mm. um, with whom she did not have that same mm. bond. And all this was very uh, interesting for Stieg Dagerman mm -hmm. because he kind of connected with the story, mm -hmm. wasn't that so, with her story. Mm -hmm. And he had his story with his mother. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened? That's how it became a, a play. Yeah, I, I, I think it's important also to say that Stieg was in France to write French Spring that would mm -hmm. follow on the heels of German Autumn, this incredible success from post-war Germany. Um, and he, he never writes the book French Spring, but he writes uh, a couple of articles, and one article is called Capitaine Jean in Memoriam. And that is about the mart in the play. It is about, very directly about, Etta's oldest mm -hmm. son, the hero who died. And then, so that is a journalistic piece that he has an article, and then he goes into the play mm -hmm. where he takes the viewpoint mm -hmm. of the younger son mm -hmm. who lives in the shadow of mm -hmm. this hero. But it's a very aggressive portrait of a mother, isn't it? Um, yeah. Kind I of mean, a revenge? We, 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 <laughs> we, we, <laughs> Do you agree? Yeah, we, we, we call her, you know, a monster mother. The monster mm -hmm. mother. Monster in the mother. play, she's the monster mother. Mm -hmm. And much of our investigation in this book was trying to figure out how much of that was based on mm -hmm. truth. You was like to Edith? defend her. <laughs> it was my job to defend her, and I will defend her. <laughs> Although I, I suspect that, as we have discovered over time, she was not very nice to her younger son. But on the other hand, she had been through an awful lot, mm -hmm. and the younger son was all that she had left. And so often we take out our mm -hmm. aggressions on the only person who is available. Mm -hmm. But but Stig Dogman didn't even <laughs> want to show her the play. Was that so? Oh, you wanted to say something? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, Stieg writes in the program notes to the play, when it opens at Dramaten, that the people in this play and who are treating the younger son, Gabriel, this way, are no monsters. They are how some people simply have turned out. And so my little thing here you know, <laughs> yes. is that what Stieg's play is really about is is sort of our imperfections and can we not be loved mm -hmm. with our imperfections um, and the younger son is trying to make that case mm -hmm. but he fails mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. only when he dares to show courage he takes the loaded gun mm -hmm. that his mother has loaded mm -hmm. and shoots her he can become lovable. Mm -hmm. What it is sounds that like a bite? Greek myth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but this is one thing to liberate yourself from your mother if you're a boy or a son. Mm -hmm. But have you been fighting about the picture if she was a a mean, monstrous mother or not? Well, that's the tension in the book, of course. <laughs> yeah. That's what makes it fun to read. That's what made it fun to write. Um, thankfully, Lou is trained in psychology, so she kept things from getting too ugly between us. <laughs> and um, if anything, I would say that if you're going to find a partner to do a project with like this, make sure that it's someone who has psychological training. That would be good <laughs> for both of you. But what I want to ask you is, even your own family, denied her or didn't tell anything about her? She you disappeared. Had... She disappeared. She oh. disappeared. Her her very famous brother did not disappear. So I grew up knowing about Paul Federn, who was a very early disciple of Freud's and quite a prominent psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. Not a word about Edda. My Why? cousin Why Edda disappeared. Why is that? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. One is that there's certain amount of sexism in mm -hmm. my business-oriented family, I would say, that came down through the generations. And Etta um, was twice divorced and so not a successful 
like success in terms of having that sort of classic Jewish family. And also she was a radical. Yeah, she was a fighter. She was a fighter mm -hmm. and a radical. And I think in uh, America in the 1950s, after mm. she died, that legacy could have mm. easily been... So what up. about a meeting between the two of them? You mean... The when they met? Yeah. Mm. So they meet in 1947 for the first time, and then they meet also uh, in 1948. Um, it is a meeting that is not documented. So we do... Our book is unique in a sense because it... It has a lot of facts, of course, but it also has a description of what our imagined meeting between the two of them. Because, so, yeah. But why did he want to meet her again? Because he went with your mother, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, when she there. was pregnant mm -hmm. with me. Why? Because, and you see, he didn't hate this woman. He was, this was a fascinating woman. She was the, still, when she was toothless and old, she could recite poems by Goethe mm -hmm. in a mesmerizing way. Um, they, they shared many things. I think that, and that's what we are also exploring in the book. He, he when he gets word of her death, it, he gets incredibly taken by that. He has lost a friend. So it's complex. It's mm. complicated. But when he goes to see her, does he feel guilt? When he returns because, after because having of written, the play, yeah. You know, um, that's a good question. A I mean, question. we asked him, you know, what were you thinking? Um, but I, I think that Stieg was ruthless in his writing. He wanted to pursue um, the truth, to investigate the relationship mm -hmm. between mother and son. And he would use himself, but he would also use other people in that quest. And he would not hold back. Mm -hmm. And maybe Etta would have said, good for you. It's mm -hmm. not a portrait of me, but good for you. Mm -hmm. No, no. Mm -hmm. I didn't do a good theatre when she saw it. She thought it was... <laughs> because <laughs> she could really see that. That was a professional, so... Well, I mean, we don't know whether she actually read mm. the play. Uh -huh, we suspect okay. that probably she did not, <laughs> and that Stieg hid it from her. But had she been to the play, mm. if she could have divorced herself mm. from that mm. character, of course, mm. she likes good drama. That's mm. how she was raised. Mm. That's, you know, she mm. understood that, that real suffering is what you... What you want to see in the theater? That's fascinating. Let uh, let me show you the picture again with uh, you and your father. Uh, when you have been doing this, what what kind of feelings do do you have when you see a picture like this? Um, you know, when we did this research, I was very moved, mm -hmm. very moved, because. At the time, he was struggling seriously, mm -hmm. seriously with depression and writer's block. And um, there are also letters, a couple of letters that he wrote to my mother, who was filming in Germany, mm -hmm. when he was taking care of me and, you know, my brothers, Dogeman brothers came to visit. Um, now, I'm very, very touched. There is a little of the two of us together, mm -hmm. and here's evidence that we were together and uh, that it was warm. Was that a new thing you found out, that it was more than you, you thought? Um, that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's been through some other sources as well, but that the first time I saw in a letter uh, he's using my name, Lo, Lopan, made me cry. Mm. <laughs> but hey, you know. Du -du 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 -du. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting book, and also to read about uh, this fantastic woman. I mean, Etta is also yes. such a story. She's a remarkable mm. woman. It's good that you be gave her life again. Oh, I'm <laughs> very proud of that. <laughs> yeah. I, yes. And, and that is thanks to Steve. Yes. So I, I think <laughs> Ironically he, enough. He would have loved that, you know. <laughs> yeah. The last laugh. Yeah. And it gets the last laugh. Yeah. Right, yeah. Because, thank you yeah. so much for coming to my show. Oh, yeah. thank, thank you so much you. for having thank us. You. What a pleasure. Och boken heter alltså Skuggorna vi bär.